one second of hate will cause a lifetime of misery. You must have seen a double barrel shotgun. But do you know the kind of force that leashes out of that weapon? At any reasonable range, shotgun slugs make effective lethal wounds due to their tremendous mass, typically traveling around 1600 feet or 500 meters per second. That's a lot of force to kill with. Now imagine the barrel of that gun pointed directly towards your face and the trigger is pushed. Chances of survival? Minimal. This is an unusual story of two average people living their everyday lives in Texas. But soon, circumstances will bring them to a crossroad that will define them through compassion, mercy, and forgiveness. Because one of these two men could have died 10 years ago. And the other one, he'll be dead soon. Uh, it was September 21st, 2001. I was working in a gas station. It was Friday at 12.30 p.m. and it was raining outside. Cats and dog business was slow. Suddenly a customer came inside the store wearing bandana, baseball cap, sunglasses, and pointing a gun directly at my face. This is Reis Bhuyan, born in Bangladesh but now living in the U.S. as an American citizen. Reis is one of those lucky ones who are still alive even though he was shot point blank with a double barrel shotgun directly in the face. Simply because someone didn't agree with his identity. I met Reis in Dallas, Texas, where he currently lives and works in the travel and IT industry. Reis is walking me through that horrific day when he almost lost his life at the hands of a lone gunman. From a previous robbery experience, I thought there would be another robbery. So I offered him the cash and I requested not to shoot me. But then the gunman's first question was pretty unsettling. In response, he asked me, where are you from? That, that's a strange question to ask during a robbery. So, and at the same time, I just feel that he is not here for money, he's here for something else. Otherwise, why is asking where I was from? So in response, I, uh, I reply, Excuse me? The gunman was Mark Stroman, a self-proclaimed white supremacist who had already shot and killed the Pakistani Waqar Hassan on September 15, 2001. And as soon as I spoke, I felt the sensation of million bees stinging my face. And then I heard an explosion. Mark Stroman had shot Reis Puyan in the face at point blank. Images of my mother, my father, fiancé, and my other siblings appeared before my eyes. And then a graveyard. I was not sure if I was still alive. I looked down and I saw blood was pouring like an open faucet from the right side of my head. And I remember myself screaming, Mom. And I looked left, I saw the gunman was still standing and looking at me. So I thought if I don't pretend I'm dying, maybe he will try to shoot me again. So I jumped on the floor. At the same time, I was crying and I was reciting from Holy Quran all the verses I memorized. And uh, after a few seconds, the gunman left the store and I was asking God, Allah, give me a chance. I don't want to die today. It's too early to leave this world. Give me a chance and I promise I will do my best to dedicate my life for others, especially for the poor, deprived and the needy one. Immediately after the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, many Americans felt angry. The nation was under attack by some terrorists who flew planes into the buildings in New York and DC. While most Americans demonstrated civility, many wanted to take irrational steps to vent their anger and frustration. Some of them did just that. Mark Anthony Stroman, a resident of Texas, was more upset than others. He had alleged that his sister was in one of those towers that fell in New York City, and his country was at war, and that the government was not doing enough, so he took matters in his own hands. Raiz Bhuyan, a native of Bangladesh who had recently moved to Texas from New York, was working at a local gas station in Dallas. Raiz, like every other day, went to work on a day that looked like any other normal day, unaware that a close call with death is waiting for him. First of all, I didn't want to die that day, and I thought that if I just, if I give up my faith, if I give up my hope, 
then maybe that's it. But if I keep myself like positive, full of faith, that right now everything is in Allah's hand, it's not on me. So rather stay positive, stay focused that I'm gonna leave. Though what, back in my mind, I was thinking that maybe it's my day. I'm gonna go, you know, I will leave this world today. But still I was trying to tell myself, no, stay positive that I will leave today. Allah will give me a chance. One seconds of hate can cause a lifetime pain and suffering. This is Mark's own message to everyone. So you can see a murderer, how he has changed and now he's talking about not to hate people. After the September 11 attacks in New York, Washington, D.C. and Pennsylvania, Raiz Bhuyan, an immigrant from Bangladesh, was shot point-blank by a self-proclaimed white supremacist, Mark Stroman. Mr. Stroman allegedly wanted to avenge the attacks on 9-11 by killing any Muslim who happens to have a Middle Eastern or South Asian origin. It was a double barrel shotgun and he shot me from four to five feet away. It was one shot, but after it was shot, it, it uh, explodes like hundreds of small pellets. I received more than 38 of them on my face and on the right side of my face. And I'm still carrying more than 35 pellets on my face. After being shot and after multiple eye surgeries, Raiz lost vision in one of his eyes. But he says he's thankful to be alive. Well, as I was shot in my face and on the right side of my head, one of the pillars penetrated my right eye and I had to go through several eye surgeries. And after several years of medical treatment, the doctor could save the right eye, but the vision is gone. After reaching the hospital, Reis lost consciousness and does not remember what happened. But after some time, when you regained his consciousness, it was like getting a second chance at life. The feelings I had in my heart that time that, yes, I'm still alive and I'm still in this world. Such a precious moment that how beautiful it's just to live, that you are still in this world. You can get to see your, your uh, loved one's face. You can talk to them. You can see them. It doesn't matter where you are, in the hospital, in a prison, anywhere. Still, you're in this world. It's a heavenly moment. I can't exp explain my own war, but I, I felt that time that both my eyes were full of tears, tears of joy that I'm still in this world. I could feel how beautiful it is just to live, live in this world. On October 4, 2011, Mark Stroman shot and killed Vasudev Patel, who was neither an Arab nor a Muslim, but who operated a local gas station in Miskit, Texas. But this time, the shooting was caught on tape. Mr. Stroman was arrested then eventually prosecuted and convicted for murder and put on death row. But Reis says he forgave Mark a long time ago. It did not take that long to forgive him. I, I, I forgave him many years ago and uh, because of my Islamic faith and the way my parents taught me that forgiveness is the best policy. If you keep anger, hate in your heart, it's, it's very hard to move on. It's very hard to lead a normal and peaceful life. So I knew right away that he was ignorant. He did not realize that killing someone in Texas, Dallas, can be the right thing. What happened in New York City or in Pennsylvania, it's not the right thing to do. You cannot justify, period. But then something else happened. Grace thought about what he had promised God while he was on his deathbed after the shooting. That if his life is spared, he will fight to save other people's lives. And that's when he began a worldwide campaign to save Mark Stroman, the man who shot him. But the question is why? Because uh, what he did that was a hate crime. And nowadays we see hate crimes and killings all over the world based on faith, color, sexual orientation and uh, nationality. So if he is executed, we will simply lose a human life without dealing with the root cause, which is hate. 
But what could have happened if Mark Stroman was given a second chance? Maybe he could have educated many people. He could have become a spokesperson raising awareness of hate crimes. If he could touch one human life, and if he could at least educate one person not to follow his path, not to follow his path which was full of hate and anger, that would have been a success. But if he was gone, then we could not touch, we could not educate anyone. Reis explains what the Quran says about saving a human life, that if you save one life, it's like saving the entire mankind. So he learned from his own mistake in course of time and maturity. So I thought now he's ready to spread this message with me to educate people. So let's do a, a, a good teamwork, help people not to hate, not to take revenge. And that is where Reis met Rick Halperin of Southern Methodist University in Dallas. Halperin is a human rights educator and a longtime activist on the front lines of the struggle against the death penalty in Texas, in the U.S. and around the world. Reis, together with Halperin, launched a worldwide campaign to save the life of Mark Stroman from death row. There has never been anything shown by the state of Texas that recognizes the rights of survivors or victims' family members. So it either is a part of the criminal justice system or it isn't. And hopefully this case will move this into the public debate as to what is Texas's commitment to people's rights who survive terrible crimes. Mark may have done something terrible, but he's not that person. He's never been that terrible a person for the rest of his life. Reis and Halperin claimed that after serving 10 years in prison, Mark Stroman was a changed man. And this change could have been used for something positive. In, in one of Mark's messages, he, he told me that if I don't survive after July 28th, dude, you move on with this message of peace and forgiveness you talk about human rights, you talk about world peace. This world need to stop hate. And that is Mark's message. So can you, do you see a person who murdered two innocent people and tried to take my life 10 years back in course of time and maturity? And, and after learning that one of his victims came forward to save his own life, whereas I, his victim had all the right to ask for revenge, ask for his death penalty, rather his victims came for and asked for his, his own life. So those kind of things changed him. And he was talking about human rights, peace, and world peace. So he should be remembered for his last days, not what in the past he changed. And we all make mistakes. Yes, his mistake was terrible, terrible, but he learned he became a different person. But critics would argue, how can you justify letting go of someone who was prosecuted and sentenced in a court of law? someone who was found guilty of the crimes he had committed. He was already punished, he got life in prison, he got death penalty, and he was behind bar for the last nine and a half years. I was not asking to let him go on the street next day, I was just asking that save this human life. Reis recalls the value of life when he himself was on the deathbed. It's a human life, it's very precious because I, I learned when I was in the deathbed, once I got my life back, I, I knew how how I was feeling that time just to get my life back. It was so beautiful, so precious, just to live in this world, you know. So I was asking to give him a chance just to save the life, not to kill him. It was not for me, it was not for him. It was for other people, those who are as ignorant as him. Maybe we'll be able to educate if we could work together as a victim, as a victimizer. That would be a powerful message to educate people. A white supremacist who murdered two store clerks. I totally disagree with Booyah. But the big question remains. What was the reaction of Mark Stroman when he found out that one of his own victims is trying to save his life? Here's Mark Stroman being interviewed by BBC correspondent Alistair Leadhead. Um, he's a pretty cool dude, man. He's pretty awesome. I mean, for him to find it in his heart, you know, because I've asked myself that question a thousand times. If you shot me in the face, could I forgive you? I would find that extremely hard. So this man right here is inspiring to me. But what motivated Mark Stroman to do what he did? Why did he take those innocent lives? Here in America, everybody was saying, 
let's get them. We didn't know who to get. We were just saying get them, so we stereotype. Just like everybody in the free world right now stereotypes everybody on death row. Oh, they're all monsters. We're not all monsters. I stereotype all Muslims as terrorists. That was wrong. Despite the efforts of Reis Bouyan and Mark Halperin and countless others around the world, Mark Stroman's life could not be spared. And on July 20, 2011, at 8.53 p.m., Mark Stroman was pronounced dead by lethal injection. What Mark Stroman did, that was a wrong, that was extremely wrong. He caused a lot of pain and suffering, not only in his life, also others' life. He learned, and before he was put to death, it was his statement. He said that, I see hate is going on all over the world, and hate has to stop. One second worth of hate can cause life full of you know, pain and suffering. So he learned from his own life by being behind bar, by killing two and try to kill myself. That's a powerful message. We both could go or talk to people that look, don't follow this path. You'll be behind bar for the rest of your life. You might be even executed. You will cause pain and suffering not only for your own family, not only for yourself, for the people whom you are hating. So let's not follow that path. So he could be a very good example. He won't talk some theory or from some book. He will be talking from his own heart, from his own experience, and that is powerful. And that's what I wanted to do, that we could build a bridge, talk to people, educate. Thus, we could spread this message all over the world that hate is not a solution. It's just one line message, but we can also explain more. The message is, let's not hate each other. Raiz Bhuyan, a victim of hate crime after September 11, 2001, tried to save the life of the man who shot him, point blank in the face, with a double barrel shotgun. Ray survived, but after recovery, he was on a battle to save the life of the very man who tried to kill him. After September 11, this war has become very unsafe. We see a lot of hate, a lot of anger, a lot of killing going on, not only in this, within this country, all over the world. Millions of people are displaced to war, major war is going on in this world. So I thought that this world needed a new direction direction, a different path of passion, forgiveness and tolerance. So, you know, I cannot ask people if I don't do something at my own first. I asked Reis the same question that many others were asking him. Why did he wait for 10 years before trying to save the life of the man who shot him? Well, I was informed after this trial was over by the DA's office that as a victim, I should not communicate with my offender. He got death penalty, so now he's on his own way. So this case is over, so we should move on with our own life. Reis claims that he was misinformed about his rights and thus could not proceed with what he really wanted to do. But once I came to know at the end of May this year that this is a victim's right, as a victim, I can ask for a mediation dialogue with my offender to understand to uh, for reconciliation. So I applied to the uh, Texas Department of Criminal Justice and I was never allowed to talk to him. But before he was executed on July 20th, I could talk to him through a cell phone through one of my friend. I was not sure, I didn't call him to call Mark. That friend was talking to Mark that time. So he, he put me to the cell phone conference call and I talked to Mark for a few seconds. And this was the first time when the victim and the offender came face to face over a phone conversation. That was their first, but eventually will be their last. It was very emotional. It was very, you know, also, um, I was not prepared to talk to him at that moment. So I was kind of like nervous, what I'm going to say, and within a few seconds. But then I, the, the, the message I always carried in my heart, not to hate, not to choose a path of, you know, crime or torture, so I said clearly, Mark, that Mark, you know for sure that I never hated you. 
I forgive you. You are just another human being like me. And you know in your heart that I have no anger against you and I don't hate you. And in return, Mark said, Grace, thank you very much for doing all these things for me. Thank you very much. You just showed a different thing. You just energized me, all those kind of good things. And he was giving me thank you again and again. He said, it's unbelievable that you could do this kind of thing. So I could pass my message that I never hated him. He's just another human being like me. Five to six seconds, then the phone conversation ended. I never could talk to him. Until the last minute, Reyes was at the courtroom trying to stop Mark Stroman's execution. His request was twofold. First, lower Mark's punishment from death to life, and the other one was to at least allow Reyes to have a mediation dialogue with his offender. If he's gone through this execution, I will never get him. He will never come back to this world to talk to me, to give all the questions I have, all the answers. But uh, since they never, the, the Department of Criminal Justice never allowed me to talk to him, so I filed a lawsuit against the Governor of Texas and also uh, Department of Criminal Justice so that they allow me to exercise my victim's right by arranging, the, arranging this mediation dialogue. So I filed this lawsuit on July 13th and I was having this hearing on July 20th at the last moment in the Travis County Court. July 20th, 2011 was the day of Mark Stroman's execution. That mediation dialogue never took place. We've sent out emails asking the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles and the Governor of Texas, asking them their reasons to deny the request of Mr. Puyan. But so far, we've not received any replies from them yet. Reyes wants to tell the world that the way Mark Stroman reacted to 9-11, he did not represent America. The guy who shot me, he shot in, in the name of patriotism. He was a white guy, he was a local Texan guy. But whatever he did, that was out of his ignorance. He was an individual person. So don't treat him as if he was a spokesperson of the white community, of the Christian community, or he was a representative of this great country. No, it would be a mistake to, to put him in that situation. He was an individual person. And that thing should be also treated in our case those folks did the 9-11, did all the terrorist attack. They were just simply a group of people. They don't represent Islam and they don't represent any country, Prophet Muhammad, Quran, anything. They were just a, a lost soul who committed this crime. They don't represent anyone. So we shouldn't be also treated the way we want to treat Mr. Stroman, not as a spokesperson, not as a spokesperson of Christianity, this country, and also white people. <laughs> Reis Buyayan is trying to remind us not to let others define you. Take the first step to get to know those who you don't know. With the help of his new nonprofit organization, with which he plans to help the victims of hate crimes worldwide. Reis already has Mark Stroman's daughter and Mr. Hassan's family and the family of Mr. Patel, the other two victims of Mark Stroman, as the board members of World Without Hate. He plans to help them first with whatever support he can give, and then move to the next level. But I asked him if he thinks he has failed. It's not my failure, it's not my shame that I could not save a human life. Rather, it's a failure and it's a shame to those people who had the power to make a change, who had the power to make a difference, but they choose not to. It's completely a shame and failure on their part. It's a success on my part that I could run a campaign, a human campaign, to save a human life. And in, in return, we could educate many people, not only in the USA, all over the world. So it was my success that I could run a campaign. It's their failure. They failed to act in a human way. For Muslims America, Imran Siddiqui, Urdu VOA, Dallas, Texas. Look at that, look, look at that. It's cool. Take that? Yeah. Come here, come here. Oh.
Oh, what a gym. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry, guys, I'm done. <laughs>